This is the Advanced Brain Podcast with third-generation neurotechnology pioneer, entrepreneur, best-selling author, music producer, keynote and TEDx speaker, Alex Doman. Improve your mental wellness as Alex sits down with the leading thought leaders of our time about how to optimize your brain, body, and life with the latest and most powerful tools to help you reach your unlimited potential. This episode was previously recorded and released as part of the Sound Brain Fitness Series and is being re-released here in the Advanced Brain Podcast. Now, listen in and discover how to become the best version of yourself with Alex Doman. Hello and good evening. I'm your host, Alex Doman, calling from Advanced Brain Technologies in Ogden, Utah. You can learn more about our vision to change lives by advancing people's brains at advancedbrain.com. So tonight's topic is music, the brain, and therapeutic results. So what does contemporary neuroscience tell us about music and the brain? And how do these findings support clinical applications of music therapy and child development, as well as recovery of, or maintenance of function in adults with brain injuries? Drawing from research and her extensive clinical work, many chronicled by Dr. Oliver Sachs, Dr. Conchetta Tomeno provides an overview of music in the brain and shares evidence for the efficacy of clinical applications of music and stroke rehabilitation, enhanced function in Parkinson's disease, and improved memory and quality of life for those with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. This program will help you understand how is music used in therapy, what is music therapy, what are some of the clinical applications of music, and how is the field of neuroscience helping inform the field of music therapy? Now, I want to tell you a bit about my guest. Uh, Dr. Tomeno is the executive director and co-founder of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function and senior vice president for music therapy at Centerlight Health System, which is formerly Beth Abram uh, Family of Health Services, where she's worked since 1980. She graduated from SUNY at Stony Brook with a BA in music performance in 1976. Uh, her instrument is the trumpet. She had a minor in psychology and sciences and a commitment to the emerging field of music therapy. She received the Master's and Doctor of Arts in Music Therapy from NYU. Now, Dr. Tomeno is internationally known for her research in the clinical applications of music and neurologic rehabilitation. She's lectured on music therapy throughout the world. She's past president of the American Association for Music Therapy and has received the award of accomplishment for music therapists for peace at the United Nations, among many, many other honors. Her work has been featured in national programs, including 48 Hours, 60 Minutes in the UK on BBC, and in many books on health and healing. Um, notably, uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks' Musicophilia is actually dedicated to her. Uh, Dr. Tomeno is on the faculty of the Albert Einstein College of Music, Lehman College, SUNY, uh, and a specialized team at the National Parkinson's Foundation in the New York State uh, Geriatric Education Consortium. Uh, I would take our hour um, talking about all of uh, Dr. Tomeno's accomplishments, but I do also want to uh, just finish in sharing that she is the founding board member of the International Association for Music and Medicine and a member of the International Advisory Council on University's Music and Health Research Collaboration at University of Toronto and has been a super panelist for the Grammy in the Schools program and has served on the cert Certification Board of Music Therapists, Journal of Music Therapy and Advisory Boards for Center of Alternative Research at the Kessler Institute and the International Journal of Arts Medicine. Connie, welcome. Hi, Alex. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm so pleased to have you join us this evening for the the listening program radio. You know, in November, I had the pleasure of meeting you in New York, and we were participating together at a panel discussion at the MAT with uh, neurologists Emmanuel During and Jay Lombard that was focused in large part on the neurological and therapeutic role and impact of music. It was, I thought, really a wonderful discussion, and it touched on many areas that we're going to be exploring uh, this evening. Now, we each know 
through personal experiences of music listening, what profound impact music can have on our mind, body, and emotions. Connie, given your unique vantage point as a pioneer in the field of music therapy, what would you say is the therapeutic role of music in human life? Well, there's obviously several aspects of music that can be therapeutic, depending on how they're experienced and how they're applied. Um, Music in and of itself, just listening to music, we know stimulates almost every aspect of brain function. It helps uh, coordinate and organize um, rhythmic processing and rhythmic perception. Uh, It helps regulate emotions. It helps regulate... Uh, physiological rhythms such as heart rhythms and respiratory rates. So, so many aspects of our uh, mental and physical being can be influenced by music in and of itself and then therapeutically applied uh, by a clinician or by a, a, a person like yourself who uses music to enhance brain function. Uh, we know that we can identify patterns of music and sound that can help organize physical function. In therapy, we can use it psychotherapeutically to help regulate emotions and uh, anxiety and other kinds of psychological states. So music has many, many therapeutic benefits and applications. Well, you know, it certainly does. And, you know, one of the questions that came in from uh, one of our listeners this evening, and and I think it's a challenging one, challenging one to answer, but can you single out a single essential element to music which is most important in its effect, you know, as you look at inst- particular instruments or the composition or the musician, the tempo, the rhythm, the key, is there any one element that we can point to which is most important? Boy, that's that, it's an interesting question. I I know for myself as a clinician, the rhythmic aspect of music, just rhythm being able to entrain and drive certain um, EEG function physiological states, enhancing and organizing movement for people with movement disorders, or even increasing and arousing attention or attending states, is is very powerful um, and readily um, accessible. So I would say rhythm at the in, is a primary, primary aspect of music that has incredible therapeutic and neurologic benefits. Um, the additive aspects of the other components of music, such as tone, each of those elements do have therapeutic applications. You know, certain types of um, scale patterns, for example, uh, can induce certain states, uh, relaxation states, arousal states. So I I hate to say that one aspect of music is more important than the other, but I know clinically for myself, I I would go with rhythm as a primary. Well, and, and, and that's what I've been seeing, too, in, in our work, and I, I think it is difficult because it, it really is a, a combination of elements, and that's one of the things that that makes music such a challenge to study in neuroscience because there are so many elements to control for. You know, right. the, you know the ultimate challenge is, is how do we take all of these unique elements that that combine to make this thing called music and begin to break them down um, and and understand what role each of them specifically play. Right. In fact, fact, uh, when I first started talking to neuroscientists back in the early 80s, uh, rhythm, or at least pattern perception, you know, sound sound and absence of sound, was something that they were able to study. They could look at arousals of of auditory nerves um, when certain frequencies were played, for example. And back then said it was impossible to study music as we experience it because of the complexity of all the elements of harmony and tone and historical, you know, emotional connections to songs and things like that. But fast forward to today... And neuroscientists are very much studying very complex uh, musical experiences, um, 
in, on many levels, emotional as well as physiological. So I think the exciting thing for me and other clinicians who are looking for, looking towards science to help us uh, val- not only validate, but to show the efficacy and the depth at which music can be used therapeutically is really uh, coming to the fore. Well, I, I think it's exciting, right? So much uh, was anecdotal observation. <laughs> so, you know, so many ideas are being validated and so many constructs are also being disrupted. <laughs> That's as the, as the science is proving out, right? Yep. <laughs> So I'm, you know, I'm curious, could you share your own relationship with music, both personally and professionally? You know, I I know uh, that the uh, trumpet is the uh, instrument of choice, but, you know, what what role does music play in your life today? Well, you know, I, I grew up um, in a, in, I won't say in a musical family in the sense that people in my family didn't play musical instruments, but... Uh, people sang and entertained with music, and I was very sensitive to music from a, a very early age and started studying accordion, actually, when I was 10, 11 years old for um, many years and used accordion very much in my music therapy work. Uh, I got involved with playing the trumpet in high school and then studied it at Stony Brook and have been playing professionally um, in orchestras and chamber music and wind ensembles since 1978 and continue to play regularly. Um, I use music both to relax as well as to energize myself. I think one of the most relaxing um, aspects of my music playing is when I'm actually playing in an ensemble and sharing music with others um, when I'm not using it in therapy. So for myself, being able to play in an ensemble and play with others is very uplifting and um, very stimulating at the same time. And so my husband, yeah, full-time so, musician, so we get to we play in the same ensemble many times. So it's really a life. So life music work. is is in you. Yes. So um, you know. <laughs> when I so when I really need to relax, sometimes I I need to shut off the music. Yeah, I, and, and that's an important point, right? Because there there are that, times that, that yes. we need quiet, we need space. Yes, absolutely. Certainly. So what was it? You know, music has, you know, been in you and part of you for a long time. Um, you know, what really drew you to choose music therapy as a career path? Well, when I, when I was um, in high, both elementary school, high school, and college, my aspiration had been to be a medical doctor, and I was a, a science geek as well as very much interested in music, and was already doing um, cellular and science experiments in high school. I had my own chemistry and biology labs that I ran and was going to pursue that. In fact, I started out as a biology major at Stony Brook. Um, but then when I started taking trumpet lessons, one of the... One of the uh, requirements for me to take lessons was to become a music major because the trumpet professor couldn't teach a non-music major. And as I double majored in biology and music, started to realize that I didn't know, even though I loved music, really had never experienced a whole range of classical and contemporary music and was absolutely in awe and overwhelmed by how beautiful this world of music was that I didn't know anything about. So for the next two years at Stony Brook, I immersed myself in studying music, realizing that I was torn between going into medicine and going into performance. I really wanted to do something in human service and contribute that way and didn't know what to do until by accident found out about the field of music therapy. And just by some serendipitous um, fate, uh, the band director at Stony Brook was also the band director at NYU, uh, where a new music therapy program had just started in the early 70s. And so I went from my undergraduate work to a master's in music therapy in 1976. And my clinical experience, one of my first clinical experiences was actually in a nursing home where I worked with individuals with late-stage dementia. And 
was told by the nurses and the physicians there that these people had absolutely no awareness of who they were or where they were, that their brains were technically non-functional, that they were just breathing and able to um, stay alive but had absolutely no mental function whatsoever. And what made me or uh, allowed me to be so um, interested in, in music in the brain was my experience playing music for those individuals and seeing that even these people who I was told had no brain function uh, available to them to watch them uh, come to life, start singing words to songs, um, becoming animated, and in that animation showed me that not only were, were their brains working very well in the sense that they were able to recognize sound as a familiar song and recall words, but there was absolutely more function in these individuals than they were being given credit for. And at that point in 19, must have been 1978, um, I made a commitment to understand how and why music can affect people so deeply and what was the role in music to access function in people who were deemed as having lost that function forever. That's a, that's a great journey that you've been on. You use the word fate, and it really seems to have been fate that, that's taken you here. And, you know, I think now, uh, you know, maybe coming on 40 years in a, in a career in, in the field of music therapy, how have you seen um, the field evolve over these four decades and acceptance of music therapy as a recognized um, health modality? Well, you know, there's been a tremendous, tremendous uh, acceptance in the past, I would say, five, ten years. Uh, I think because of the changing, uh, the change in, in medicine and the public's and and the medical community's awareness, they um, pharmaceutical treatments, uh, certain medical treatments aren't always the only. Um, only tool that we have to heal ourselves, that the brain is very dynamic, the brain is always changes, there's many things that influence how we heal, and they're treating symptoms uh, through pharmaceutical or surgery or whatever that is, aren't always the only cures that are available, and that alternative practices um, are very much uh, in line and as important as these traditional therapies. So I think the openness and acceptance amongst the physicians and um, and the public is allowing us to gain more acceptance. Uh, the fact that music therapy has been around for 60 plus years in the United States and there's growing a, a huge body of evidence-based practice uh, that the public is becoming aware of, that because that's available now, people are starting to understand uh, the full range of what music therapy can do and how it can be applied to a host of a whole range of of not only diseases but in wellness and development. And so the public's awareness as well has uh, made it more acceptable. So those two things for sure. And then the uh, media and other ways that music therapy is being shown uh, move a recent movie like Alive Inside where people are listening to autobiographical familiar music. People with Alzheimer's disease um, are awakened in the moment of hearing that music and other um, films as well. When uh, when Awakenings was made, the film based on Oliver Sacks' book, there's a scene in there that where people start becoming animated and able to move when music is played. So the public has been exposed to music as therapy, and I think the science now and these publications that are becoming more and more available to the public are helping us gain acceptance. Well, it, it's got to be exciting for you, having having been a champion of the field for so long, to say people are listening. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, you know, music therapy is a term that is used almost universally for any use of music for a therapeutic purpose. Um, you know, it almost becomes, you know, like uh, Kleenex for 
tissue. Um, but, you know, music therapy is a very specific field. Can you, uh, for our listeners that aren't familiar with the field of music therapy, share what exactly music therapy is? Sure. Well, the definition of music therapy is the use of music and the components of music by a licensed professional in an interpersonal relationship to improve cognitive, neurological, psychological, and uh, wellness in individuals who may need it. And the American Music Therapy Association in, in the United States has lots of information about the field of music therapy and what one has to do to become a music therapist. Uh, for example, there are degree programs, approved degree programs in the States and, and around the world. Uh, there's a World Association of Music Therapy. So a person has a degree in music therapy, and then during that degree, they learn uh, and achieve certain competencies. There's competencies in music in and of itself, and then clinical applications of music, psychodynamic processes, development, um, anatomy, physiology, all of those things are taught at, at the course and school level. And then during their education, they also have clinical experience with various populations, both early childhood development, uh, medicine, adult psychiatry, for example, and uh, geriatric care. After those clinical experiences, the music therapist applies and um, undertakes a 1,200-hour supervised clinical internship in an area of specialty. And after that, after successfully completing that clinical internship, then they sit for a standardized board exam, a national board exam, that upon completion and passing gives them the title Music Therapist Board Certified. That so is... it's a it's a long process and and the and um yeah <laughs> uh, when I I hesitate a lot on this because there are many people uh, who use music therapeutically um, and who often use the term music therapy. In fact, the public tends to, like you said generally use music therapy for, or the term music therapy for any music that is therapeutic in any way. But I think it's important for people to realize that there is very, a, a very strong profession in music therapy, and to become a music therapist takes not only basic education, but a lot of clinical experience. Oh, well, it, it certainly does. You know, this came up, um, you you mentioned Alive and alive inside and you know i know you've you've had some <clears throat> impact on the music and memory program and i had uh, the founder of that program dan cohen on the listening program radio recently and we we delved into this and in advanced brain technologies we run into this too because we we develop um, recorded um, music listening therapies uh, that are that are used for patients they're not live performance they're they're recorded and we you know we always really struggle what is the right language for that you know it clearly isn't music therapy um, but as I see the the term used and like I said like Kleenex you know right. please hand me a Kleenex um, you know that is a brand and music therapy has you know become this uh, somewhat universal term for any application of music and uh, I I know it's very important for people to understand the distinction of that field versus music as a therapy. Right. So I think I think that besides understanding that there is a profession and and the training of a music therapist is uh, that music therapists are aware of very much the influence of music on human function and human experience, and then based on that person's clinical need, can manipulate the music in real time because music therapy sessions are live, usually live and interactive with the client. And so as we observe the client's response, uh, we can enhance and change how that person responds to the music 
or how we deliver the music to engage them further in that experience. For example, somebody who I work with people who have aphasia, which is a, a loss of speech communication after a stroke. And these people may be able to understand what's being said to them, but cannot actually say or form a sentence. And often they can sing. So as I'm working with this individual, I may be cueing words. I know that they can sing words, but I may be cueing their um, their use of words in context through a melodic line or a melodic tone. And in that interactive experience, are enabling them to increase their u- use of words. So it's not like they're just listening to music or singing along with music, but I'm actually coaxing them in the moment to achieve further communication skills. So I, I want to touch on that quickly because there there is um, you know melodic intonation therapy. You know my my grandfather was a physiatrist. He was a rehabilitation physician. And even with patients back in the in the mid 1940s, he would. Uh, have uh, post-stroke uh, patients sing um, before speech uh, as, as a precursor to speech. And I just had a question come in today, and, I, and I'm curious if you can answer this. What is it about singing words that is apparently easier than speaking words in a rehabilitative situation? Right. Well, speaking speaking words, just recalling and and putting words in a in a phrase or actually articulating the words is primary. At least what I understand is primarily a left brain activity. Um, singing or the aspect of tone in speech is a right dominant brain activity. People who have aphasia usually have at least the kind of aphasia that benefits from singing and melodic intonation therapy are people who've had a stroke in an area of the brain called Broca's region on the left side of the brain, left hemisphere. So in these individuals, their left speech area has been damaged, but their right singing dominant area is still intact. And so people are able to sing and intone words with greater ease because the part of the brain that is dominant for that skill is still available to them. Historically, neurologists used to think that this was just um, two completely different functions, that just because somebody could sing words um, wouldn't wouldn't mean that that would carry over into independent speech outside of music, outside of singing. But over the years, we've we've observed, I've observed, and and mo- more recently, there's been neuroscience studies that when somebody does engage in very rigorous singing therapy as well as melodic intonation therapy, that there is carryover to fluid speech and increased ability to initiate and find word and recall words. So now we know that there's some overlapping networks that are shared and that with increased activity of singing and using words embedded in song as well as toning those words as in melodic intonation therapy, uh, that there is also increased um development on the right side of the brain as a compensatory mechanism. Wonderful. And I, I wanna I wanna go back um just a little bit in, you know, the discussion of, you know, music therapy. It it's a real time and it it it's a dialogue between therapist and patient. As a music therapist, how do you decide what kind of music is going to be presented to a patient based on a specific condition? Let's maybe say um, we have a Parkinson's patient uh, as as an example. 
Um, where where do you begin? Sure. Well, I, you said an important word. It's it's the goals for the individual and what we hope to achieve with those goals and what the capability of the patient is at the very onset of therapy. So in the case of somebody with Parkinson's disease, there's actually several areas um, of treatment that can be used effectively for people with Parkinson's depending on where their primary need is. The most obvious uh, need is usually to help initiate movement or to help um, improve their gait, their walking ability. In that case, uh, the music therapist would explore certain rhythmic patterns, very steady patterns, with um, or cadence, something to be enforced cadence. And in this case, the the tempo, as well as the del- yeah, so the tempo would include the delay of the sound from one beat to another, um, and the the timing of that or the pattern of that beat would be important as well. So um, the therapist would explore what beat would help the person or where the person's present gait is at the onset of therapy, have the person take a couple of steps. If you can imagine um, timing those steps and say the person is hesitating on every beat, then the therapist would reinforce with a drum or some kind of rhythmic sound a very steady beat and watch as the person adapts their steps and then trains their steps to the music. If it works on the very steady beat, then we'll adjust that tempo so the person is successfully walking to that beat. Sometimes people with Parkinson's lose their perception of rhythm and so in those cases, we have to have them experience various tempi and various beat patterns to see where they feel, actually feel where the beat is going to come and anticipate the beat and then ad- adapt the rhythmic pattern that they can use most effectively. People with Parkinson's also lose their speech, um, the volume of their speech. They tend to speak very softly or sometimes they lose um, certain aspects of articulation. In those instances, we can use uh, humming and other types of oral um, singing techniques to help enhance articulation as well as volume control and, be- and breath support. And then psychotherapeutically, people with Parkinson's, um, because of the slowness in brain function, also tend to present uh, some level of depression. And so we can help them work through issues psychotherapeutically, too, with music. I, I think those are great examples. And, you know, Parkinson's disease being, you know, one specific type of neurodegenerative condition, maybe switching over to Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, what role does music therapy play in um, memory? Sure. Now, we, one of the exciting things about the use of of music for people with dementia, especially toward the middle and late stages, is that because the role music plays in our lives, that throughout our lives we associate events and people with the music that we enjoy and hold in our memories. And so those feelings and associations and historical events are all very much connected to the music that we've associated with those events. And those associations are almost hardwired with that memory of that music and the recall of that music. So we can use music of personal importance, of historical importance, of what the biographical importance to help a person with Alzheimer's disease and dementia reassociate personal history with that piece of music. And in the listening of the music, actually their recognition memory is stimulated in that moment almost instantaneously. And if we can continue to use that music with that individual, those recollections and recognition memory continue to be aroused and stimulated 
so much so that we also see carryover into day-to-day type memory function. We see the people, the person become more alert and more attentive. Um, many times the person will even improve in short-term memory in the sense that they can start recalling people's names of people that they are with every day and things like that. So we know that arousing and stimulating preserved networks that are involved in memory recognition, if those are stimulated well enough, that there is carryover to other aspects of memory function too. So that's using familiar song or autobiographical songs to help engage recognition memory. In early stages of dementia, we can use information embedded in melodies or rhythmic patterns uh, as a mnemonic device to help with memory storage. So somebody who is forgetting their phone number or people's names or days of the week or appointments, those those aspects of um, routine and daily um, information that they would need to use can be put to um, music the same way commercials use jingles to help you recall their, the company's phone number. So we know that information that connected and associated with, with sound and music, the sound helps reinforce the storage of that information and also helps prime and uh, helps in the recall of that information as well. So we're, we're, we are seeing primarily episodic memory changes, but we, we're also seeing some changes in, in working in short-term memory. And and I, I think that that ability to um, have that memory and, and have that connection reduces stress, reduces, reduces anxiety, and allows that individual to be more comfortable uh, in their environment because they're not quite as disoriented. That's right. Um, That's how it's um, music is often used in nursing homes, or hopefully it'll be increasingly used in nursing homes because um, the type of agitation and discomfort that's often observed by by um, the staff in nursing homes for, of the residents, uh, that agitation and disruptive behaviors are usually caused caused by the fact that the person is uncomfortable and and not aware of the environment. So that anxiety that the, that the resident has um, can be subdued by familiar music because the familiar music does provide a sense of safety and familiarity that helps calm them down and reduces those types of behaviors. And there's been oh. some studies that have shown that Yeah, I've I've had uh, experience doing uh, consults with you know patients that are in coma and that are um, you know post post trauma you know TBI and you know people ask us you know what what of your music you know should we use first and uh, I say none <laughs> we 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 need to go to the music that that individual most loved and connects to and, and right give them that sense of safety and familiarity, um, that is the most therapeutic of all. That's absolutely right. So um, I, I'm interested. We've, we've talked a lot about of adult. What has been your experience with the benefits of uh, music therapy for children uh, that have neurological conditions, say uh, autism, for example? Is there a, a growing body of work happening in music therapy and research there? Yes, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, music, music therapy for children with autism can take many forms, um, and there's several practices in music therapy that are focused just on these types of developmental delays. Um, a, a child with autism can have, as you know, a, a full spectrum of um, conditions depending on where on the spectrum they lie. So 
For example, a, a child with autism may have sensory integration problems where sound and sight and other sensory inputs may not be well connected, so the child is perceiving um, and not being able to put together what those and make the connections of what those sensory inputs are. So sound may be overwhelming. Complex sound may, may be overwhelming. Um, the child may have to learn how to integrate um, sound in a very uh, specific way. Uh, language development can be enhanced by sound patterns that are precursors to actual word formation. So music can be used to help the child um, learn to use sounds as a form of communication, as a precursor to verbal communication. And many times in music therapy, um, in this work, it's really uh, a lot of it is in the child being able to relate and interact with a, a per another person and to be able to communicate on some level. Um, so that is done in music therapy as well. And then on a neurologic level, um, in, in motor development and coordination, music therapy will be used to help that child develop increased coordination and impulse control and other types of uh, physical aspects that, can, that need improvement that can be done through music. Uh, thank you. And, you know, I, I re really hadn't thought about it, but that social engagement aspect of the, the music therapist in, engaging that child's attention and beginning to bring about positive social engagement behaviors have to have a huge impact on those kids. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and do you have any insights uh, on applications of music therapy for pain management? Oh, you know, yes, there's, in fact, there's quite a bit written about that, and it's one of the most effective uses of music, um, both in medical uh, situations as well as in various treatments, um, and also people uh, can use this in their own daily life. There's been there's some neuroscience evidence on, of both top down gating of pain perception when somebody's listening to music, as well as um, gating of the various networks that send pain signals from the periphery back to the brain. So something about the auditory system when somebody is listening to music and engaged in listening to music dampens the sensory inputs both from the periphery as well as from the top down brain being, uh, responding to that pain signal. So we know that the auditory system, just being engaged in listening to something, will gate that experience. Um, we also know that when somebody's listening to music that they find pleasurable, that um, they have an emotional connection to, that there's neurochemicals that get re released in the brain that also help with mediating the pain signal response. And so um, music is music listening, in this case, is a very effective treatment for gating that it's used. Um, there's been some great research in pre- and post-surgical procedures in using music, having the person listen to their preferred music um, right before surgery as a way of helping them relax uh, before they go into the procedure. And research has shown that the anesthesiologist use, usually uses less anesthesia or lower level um, during the surgical procedure because the client is already, the patient is already relaxed in a relaxed state going in. And then when the client is able to listen to the music post-surgery, um, that their recovery is also qu quicker. And so there's been some great research on that. Um, there's been some publications also on and research on using music during childbirth, um, during um, chemotherapy sessions, um, infusion therapy, so many aspects of uh, where music therapy can be, well, music, can, music listening can be used to reduce uh, the various types of discomfort that 
one can experience during various medical procedures. Well, and and you you know, so as you think of you know mechanisms of action, and um, you're you're discussing sensory gate mechanisms, which is something we've we've studied um, with respect to hyperacusis. And, and pain is, and pain and discomfort associated with um, certain presentation of sounds, and you know, looking at that both bottom up and top down network influence. But it seems that in in large part, what music really can do is serve as attraction, uh, distraction to redirect attention away from pain to that music. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Is it ultimately a I, I redirection that, of attention? Well, I think it, I know the gating aspect is definitely there. So, um, obviously, mul- multiple aspects of um, attention and awareness are in play as well. I mean, in fact, the fact that that music is stimulating many aspects of brain function at one time, it's going to influence many aspects of our response as well, right? So uh, any distraction in and of itself is going to reduce the experience of pain. I think um, for some reason the auditory system and the pleasurable aspects that music provides does more than just divert attention. So I think it happens on a deeper level although I can't explain exactly the mechanisms by which it happens. We we have much to learn. Yeah, uh, you know, sure. it, you know, it's often said music is a, a universal language, so at, at some level our brains really seem to be wired toward a, a certain understanding of music. It It's uh, innate to the human condition. I think we uh, we have many decades and, you know, perhaps uh, longer to to understand ultimately what the impacts can be on each yeah. of us. I, I think that's really the challenge is that because music comprises so, combines so many aspects of um of sound perception as well as uh, electrical, you know, changes as well as um, frequency changes, all of those perceptual aspects that stimulate and drive multi-levels of brain activity um, makes it difficult to study as well as very exciting to study. Uh, Truly very exciting, especially when when you see the results in front of you day to day. Yeah, and, and and on that, I know you've enjoyed a long friendship in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Oliver Sachs. What brought you two together in your in your collaboration of neurology and music therapy? Well, again, this is one of these uh, aspects of fate. Um, I had my experience with the patients with dementia happened two years before I came to Beth Abraham. Um, Oliver Sachs had been at Beth Abraham since the mid-60s. Um, so here I am as the newbie um, experiencing or well, observing responses to music and changes in patients when they listen to music. And he had already had this experience 10 years prior with his awakenings patients, uh, watching them uh, become mobile um, and animated when music was played for them. So he was the attending neurologist at Beth Abraham when I I was hired as the music therapist in 1980. And when I found out that he was interested in in music and and the impact that music had on the residents, uh, I immediately uh, tried to get in touch with him and introduce myself. He actually reached out to me first just in a note to welcome me to the facility and and so we should talk. And since then, we've been... uh, Discussing a lot and we're and working together a lot those early those early years he he left that Abraham uh, several years ago, but in the early years we would he would observe my patients he would observe me working with my patients um, we would have discussions about how and why music can arouse this level of responsiveness um like I mentioned in the early eighties uh we both of us approached neuro 
neuroscientists to see if they could help us study uh, why music was affecting our patients with neurologic diseases so uh, dramatically, and, and can we show that the brain is actually changing? And back then, you know, the scientists said, well, the brain can change. You know, it's, once it's damaged, it's damaged, and what you're seeing is some kind of compensation or, or residual function, but it's not going to amount to anything more than just, you know, a slight little artifact of response. Um, but yet we kept pursuing that, and in the late 80s, early 90s, our administration at Beth Abraham, which is now Central Light Health System, said, you know, um, Oliver and Connie want to start an institute. We should support them in doing that. And so uh, through their help, we were able to to do that. And I had a, a fortunate to have um, Arnold Goldstein, who was hired as by the administration to help us organize the institute, um, made it become a reality. And, and the mission of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function was, and is to um, bring together the worlds of neuroscience and clinical music therapy so we can enhance not only our understanding of music in the brain, but how we can apply it better clinically to help a host of conditions. Well, and could you just take a moment? I mean, I have I am uh, somewhat blown away by the number of programs that you're you're running at your facility. Can you just give us a high level overview of what what happens over there? Well, it, it's interesting because the institute. Um, had started out purely as a research institute um, in, in the late 90s. And the music therapy program was only part of the single nursing home, which is Beth Abraham uh, Health Services. But then as Beth Abraham grew and eventually became Centralite Health System, uh, the nursing homes the number of nursing homes increased. There's actually four skilled nursing subacute rehab facilities and uh, a home care managed home care program since light healthcare that that serves about fourteen thousand people a day. Okay, so many, many people in the network. Our music therapy programs um, then merged into the institute. So from a, a, a single clinical department in one nursing home the responsibility for music therapy was still under my direction. And as the organization grew, the music therapy programs and the types of clinical applications grew to serve the growing number of clients. So, for example, um, our music therapy programs include pain management, um, all aspects of subacute rehab, including gait enhancement, speech rehabilitation, cognitive rehab um, programs to enhance um, behavioral responses in people with Alzheimer's disease as well as working with memory function in people with Alzheimer's and dementia. We're working in behavioral health with people with depression and anxiety and agitation. Um, the Institute Centralite serves mostly adult populations, uh, but we, the Institute also has a separate professional practice, um, and so we do work with children as well. So we've treated children with uh, epilepsy, uh, helping them reduce incidence of and episodes of epilepsy through specialized use of music. Uh, we've also worked with children with language delays. Congratulations. It's you, a lot. Have, you have developed a, an, an, an amazing program over there, and I'm sitting here thinking over your storied career, is there a particular patient um, success that stands out in your memory? Well, there's one. Um, I had the good fortune uh, and opportunity to work um, with somebody who was a, a musicologist, and very well-known musicologist, by the way. And he had a, a major stroke. Um, when he came to our facility, he was able to, to walk, but he had lost all his speech. 
Mm. And not lo- only had he lost his speech, but he also lost his ability to sing. And this person had recorded folk songs his whole life and had an anthology of folk songs. And he wasn't—he had lost the melody in his in his voice too, which was unusual for somebody who um, had a, a, this type of stroke. Um, but because he had such a wealth of of music and and lyrics of songs that he had lyrics they had known so well, um, I would work with him every day on just singing to him the songs and having him tap along as best he could to the melody um, and the rhythm of the words. And then slowly, slowly he was able to start singing the words back. And as he started to sing the lyrics and the words back, uh, little by little, his speech started coming back as well. So over the course of two months, um, his speech did come back. And he was able to speak without any musical prompts whatsoever. How exciting that had to be! It was. It was very exciting, especially um, working with this particular individual and knowing that this could come back and and be restored. So I, you know, I'm I'm watching. Um, it's interesting. There was a, an article that just came out in our local papers in, in Salt Lake City about um, piano sales declining <laughs> and piano stores closing down and, and children having less access to pianos. And I and, I, and I, I hadn't thought about that. You know, what I tend to think of with kids in music is just the fact that the budgets for arts programs in schools have just been slashed to near non-existence and music seems to go first. Um, How essential do you believe that learning to play an instrument is to a child? You know, there's there's some wonderful research right now um, that's been coming out that, that talks about the importance of that very thing. They, the aspect of learning musical notation, being able to apply that um, interpretation of musical notation to play an instrument, all the aspects of learning to play an instrument engage so many levels of brain function, both the graphic interpretation, the physical coordination, the eye-hand coordination, the auditory inputs, all of that. Um, enhances the development of the very networks that are involved in, in complex thinking and mathematics. All the things that we used to talk, say that music can enhance are actually being shown through scientific research, neuroscience research, that those changes are actually taking place. Um, so I think it's crucial that children are exposed and learn um, a musical instrument early on um, that they're exposed to all aspects of music and um, and engaged in in music making with others as well. And whatever they may, whatever that might be, a family doesn't have to have a piano. We've that's got our right. Voices. Well, that's we, right. Well, that's, you, you can have a drum. You can beat pots and pans. We can make music from about anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's several aspects of that. There's the there's a music perception and integration that, yes, can happen without necessarily with a, a musical instrument, um, but there's also the, the the physical integration and the reading of music that also has a, a level of complexity that enhances um, higher level skills. Um, I think the challenge these days is that so much of music making and music composition can be done digitally. Right. Um, and with very quick success. And so some of the argument I hear amongst uh, other musicians is whether children need to learn a classical musical instrument to appreciate and, and compose music because digital software and digital technologies make creating music and playing music with others um, easier because of these technologies. The the learning curve is, is much quicker. So I don't know if, if the aspect of digital music making is being researched at all. No, 
Wow, that, and, that, that that's an in, interesting idea and, and something else I I haven't considered. You know, in our in our own home, uh, our our three boys, including our youngest, have been essentially soft taught self taught by ear, and it makes it difficult for them to then go back and learn music notation. And, and reading music, and um, you know, there is that aspect to a, a classical approach to right. music education that uh, I I think is still very important. And our digital sor- shortcuts are, for the long term, not always the the right choice. Right. Well, uh, Connie, thank you. Um, We've uh, run the course of our our hour and uh, had so many more questions for you, and we we really uh, covered a, a broad range of of information. So I just want to thank you uh, very much for uh, sharing your your inspiring work and and research uh, at the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function, and uh, I'm excited to see what continues to come. Uh, for our uh, listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Uh, Tomano's work, um, go to musictherapy.imnf.org. If you'd like more information on the listening program and advanced brain technologies, visit advancedbrain.com or give us a call at area code 801 622 Five six seven six. So, uh, Connie, thank you once again for taking the time to join us this evening, and thank you uh, for everyone listening. And uh, I wish you all a happy, healthy, and uh, prosperous New Year. Good. Thanks so much, Alex. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Advanced Brain Podcast with best-selling author keynote speaker, and founder of Advanced Brain Technologies, Alex Doman. In the show notes, you can find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it's free to subscribe, and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen to in your podcast app of choice. And for more information regarding the world's most innovative neuroscience-based music programs for optimal human performance, please visit advancedbrain.com.